Here we are again. Hello. Welcome back. And I'm sorry if you hear a chorus of dogs in the background doing this. They're having a, I don't know what's going it's on, nice but they're having day. a- They're just enjoying <laughs> it. They're just talking it up. So if you heard really dogs, are. nothing we can really do about it. <laughs> but uh, we're excited about tomorrow. We are. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is donut day. It is. Donut day, I got the shirt. I am whoop, ready. Whoop. Donut. Donut day. I haven't had, I've had donuts. I've had healthy donuts, but I haven't had a real donut in like a, a few years. Yeah, you haven't had them in a while. No, but, but she I has. have partaken. Uh-huh. But we both love donuts no matter what. It's They're amazing. But you might not know the history behind them, how they became to what they are today. We sure didn't until we, didn't. we no. found out. We like did. you're about to. Oh, yes. This is so exciting. So we're going to teach you. Well, not teach you. We're going to share with you. Uh, <laughs> now class, <laughs> get out your notebooks. There's going to be a quiz at the end. Yeah, no. Um, but we're gonna share um, just some history about donuts and how they came to be. Um, so it started maybe even farther than you even thought. So it kind of goes back like centuries ago um, in ancient Rome and Greece where cooks would, they would fry strips of pastry dough and coat them with honey or fish sauce, which doesn't really sound that good. Fish sauce. Not. Fish sauce. Ooh. No, thanks. No, maybe I guess it's more of a savory thing. And then in medieval times, um, Arab cooks started frying up small portions of unsweetened yeast dough and they called them uh, Arab fritters, drenching the plain fried blobs in sugary syrup to sweeten them. So it got, it got a little bit better. A little bit better. It did. <laughs> Started no fish sauce anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, these Arab fritters were brought into Northern Europe in the 1400s and became popular in England, Germany, and the Netherlands. So uh, in the 15th century, Germany, uh, where sugar was hard to come by at that time, they often cooked with savory fillings um, like meat and mushrooms. They were introduced to America by the Dutch in the New Netherlands um, as the Olikoken, fun word, Oli <laughs> Uh They were oil cakes or fried cakes. Uh, and then they were made with yeast, dough, eggs, butter, spices, and dried fruits. And the dried fruits and um, a final dusting of sugar is what gave it the sweetness. And then the dough was usually somewhat sticky. Um, this was because of the additional flour added. It was kind of to toughen and mask the spicy and buttery flavors. And it was dropped into hot rapeseed oil um, as blobs. So these were still blobs. They were not quite donuts. Yeah, we're not at donuts yet. No, just blobs, not there. but we're getting there. Mm-hmm. Yep. So these donuts, as we said, uh, were kind of like irregular blobs, like little circles. And these were called Oli Bullen or oil oil fried balls and they were eaten during the Dutch Christmas season which extended through New Year's through the 12th night which is um, January 6th and for special occasions um, throughout the year so they're very popular among the Dutch. Yes. Mm -hmm. So talked about how they originated now how'd they get their shape? How'd they get the donut hole? What happened? Um, Eventually the holes were added to the center of the fritters to create the shape of the donut that we know today. Um, The invention actually came out of necessity and not for looks. At a certain point egg yolks were added to the dough, it was discovered that this produced a richer and firmer end product. And the problem was that with these fritters, when you added that stuff, sometimes the center would end up being raw because the outside will cook first. So they figured, well, let's just take out the inside. That's exactly what they did. They just would take out the inner part of the dough. And of course, what I'm thinking is they didn't waste the dough. They would use that for another donut. Right. They just cut a little hole in it. And then that would remove the problem of the rawness. Yes, thank you. I kind of come up with the word raw. <laughs> Rawness yeah. for the center. So the whole invention is generally credited to Captain Hanson Gregory. I like that he's a captain. <laughs> I like that. The, yeah. The captain made a donut hole. <laughs> um, he was a Dutch sailor whose mother made him some donuts for a voyage around the 1840s. See, moms have been giving us food yeah. since the 1840s. Elizabeth Gregory, the captain's mother, made a deep fried dough that used her son's spice cargo of nutmeg and cinnamon along with lemon rind. Some say she made it so her son and crew could store pastry on a long voyage, uh, one that might actually help ward off scurvy and colds. Elizabeth Gregory also put hazelnuts or walnuts in the center, making holes where the dough might not cook through. She called them donuts because they were literally dough with nuts. Yep. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, why not? Right. Um, The first printed recipe for donuts can be found in an English cookbook dating back to 1803, included as part of an appendix for American recipes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it's actually funny with um, this captain. I think it's more his mother that kind of thought this up, but he tried to take credit saying that he made the donut hole by using like, he wanted a free hand while he was manning his ship or whatever. So he stuck it in like a spike on the ship and he, there was a hole. We're not exactly sure if that's true or not. He was just maybe making up some Come stories. Come on, your mom did it, <laughs> captain. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool that it was your mom, but it was still your mom. So donuts didn't become a big staple in America till um, World War I when millions of American doughboys, which were soldiers, um, were brought millions of donuts in the trenches of France. Um, they were served by Salvation Army slash volunteer women. These were called the Donut Girls. Later they were called the do Donut Dollies in World War II. Um, and they even brought them to the front lines to give soldiers a sweet treat. Um, when the doughboys came back from the war, donuts stayed uh, popular as the soldiers really wanted some more donuts after the war. Like these are good. I was like, hey, let's more. keep it going. Yeah, we like these. <laughs> Uh, so that's what kind of kept them kept them going. And uh, funny, the name Doughboy actually doesn't come from donuts. Um, it started back in the Civil War when the cavalry soldiers became known as that, possibly because of their brass buttons kind of looked like um, flour dumplings, or because soldiers used to flour or used to use flour to polish their white belts. All right, so moving on to Jewish donuts. Um, the donut also has a rich history in Jewish cooking as well. Mm -hmm. So among Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews, deep fried dough balls known as, hang on, Sufganiot or <laughs> Bumulos, be, be, Bumulos, 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 I think, I don't know, okay, are prepared today very similar to how they were made more than a thousand years ago. They are most likely served on holidays and festive occasions like Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. So the first donut machine didn't really come into play until the 1920s in New York City when a Jewish refugee um, from Russia named um, Adolf Levin uh, and he began selling fried donuts from his bakery and then crowds asked him to make a gadget that churned out the donut rings faster So he did he invented it. He's like, you know, what? we'll make it happen. Yeah uh, As the years went by the machines grew more refined and the items spread by 1931 The New Yorker was writing to its writers We can tell you a little about the donut making places in Broadway and described how donuts float dreamily through a grease canal in a glass enclosed machine walk dreamily up the moving ramp and tumble dreamily into a outgoing basket. Very dreamily. All while dreaming. <laughs> By then, um, Adolf Levitt's machines were earning him $25 million a year. So it was mostly from wholesale deliveries to bakers around the country. So he was getting pretty big here. By 1934, uh, the World's Fair in Chicago, donuts were made very popular among pu the public and were sold at the fair. Donut cost less than a nickel, which was something people could afford back then in the Depression. You know, every now and then, it's good a donut. Right. All right, so Krispy Kreme. It was 1930. Yeah, it was 1930. <laughs> um, and half of the country away from Levitt's Harlem Bakery, where he was, you know, doing all his stuff, a Frenchman named Joe Lebou made his way from New Orleans to Paducah, Kentucky. Probably the hard times led him to sell his secret donut recipe and the name Krispy Kreme to a local store owner named Ishmael Armstrong. And he hired his nephew, Vernon Rudolph, to put him to work selling the treats door to door. So in 1937, Vernon and two friends found themselves in Winston-Salem, North Carolina with just 25 bucks between them. They borrowed ingredients, potatoes, sugar, and milk from a grocer, emerged with a fresh batch of Krispy Kremes, which they delivered in their 1936 Pontiac. North Carolinians soon found out about Vernon Rudolph's operation, you know, very hush-hush. I'm sure you had to have an in to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's hard to stay wholesale when donuts keep flying off the racks, Rudolph, like Levitt before him, boosted local sales by letting the public see as well as buy. Krispy Kreme still uses this wholesale retail system, selling to grocery stores and to passers-by who watch for the neon hot donuts now sign to light up, signaling a fresh batch. I have to come clean. Never had a Krispy Kreme donut before. Move. What? What? I'm out. What? I'm out. What? I can't. Okay. No, I can't. Can't do this. Bye. What, you're mad at me because I've never had a Krispy Kreme donut? I, I've never had a donut. What? I didn't think she'd be that offended. I'm back. She came back. <laughs> she came back. I didn't even know she's had a Krispy Kreme donut, to be quite honest. Krispy Kreme donuts. 
are amazing. Never. And they deserve credit. I'm a Dunkin' Donut kind of gal. When have you had a Krispy Kreme donut? When? All the time. Okay, now that is exaggeration. the problem. We don't have one close to our house. No, we don't. So you think I don't eat them all the time. But when when we go places and there is a Krispy Kreme, you have to get Krispy Kreme donuts. And I don't even think that's true. I think I remember we actually went to the factory one time when you were really little. And I'm pretty sure you did eat one. Oh, there, okay. So. I have no memory of that. Makes, but. That, that's <laughs> how I'm dealing with this situation right now, is that I'm realizing that you probably have and you just don't realize it. <laughs> and that way we both have had them. So. so apparently, you can just unsubscribe and leave forever if you haven't had a donut to Laura, a Krispy Kreme donut. So if you're in America, pretty much you gotta eat one. <laughs> Unless you have like an allergy, then okay. All right, so um, the last thing is Dunkin' Donuts. My personal favorite. I love Dunkin' Donuts. I agree, they're good. They are good. So by the late 1950s, there were 29 Krispy Kreme factories in 12 states, but they faced some competition. Um, that was Dunkin' Donuts because that started in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1950, and it's been doing well ever since, I think. It's Imagine still around. it's been doing well. Yep. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of how Dunkin' Donuts got its start. So William Rosen the son of immigrant Jewish parents, was operating a catering business in which he sold snacks in secondhand trucks near factories around his native Dorchester, Massachusetts. And then he noticed that his donuts were and coffee were counting for 40% of his sales. <laughs> and it's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. So in 1948, he launched a donut shop called the Open Kettle in Quincy, Massachusetts. This store would eventually become, in Rosenberg's words, the world's largest coffee and baking goods chain. Two years after opening, Rosenberg changed the store's name to Dunkin' Donuts. Now just Dunkin'. Dunkin' Donuts. Why would you change your name to just Dunkin'? That never got, like, people go for the donuts. I'm sorry. They want to <laughs> be known for breakfast, too. Yeah, that and coffee, but I'm sorry. You're, you're Dunkin' Donuts forever. That's just you. Yes, it's hashtag Dunkin' Donuts forever. <laughs> yeah. So by 1963, there were 100 Dunkin' Donuts shops, and by 1979, there were 1,000. That's a pretty good business he's got going on there. Oh, yeah. By the time of Rosenberg's death, there were more than 5,000 Dunkin' Donuts shops, uh, including 40 outlets in nearly 40 countries and serving nearly 2 million customers per day. Wow. People like donuts, oh, people. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so Dunkin' Donuts has stores in twice as many states as Krispy Kreme cream and in 37 other countries and sells nearly five times as many donuts worldwide. In the United States alone, about 10 billion donuts are made every day with Dunkin' Donuts and a mere 1.1 billion donuts by Krispy Kreme. So that is the history of donuts and that's what we have to share today. I'm sure there's more on donuts that we, we didn't even cover, um, but that's the general thing. And uh, let us know down below what your favorite donut is and if you are a Krispy Kremer, or a Dunkin' Donuter. We would love to know. Let us know. Yes, and now it is time for the news. Hello, and let me be the first to remind you about tomorrow. It is International Donut Day, and I am so excited. I can't even tell you. <gasps> hey, could we get extra donuts in the break room tomorrow? Come on, why not? Well, yeah, I know there's a budget. Come on, it's Donut Day, <gasps> Phil. Oh, <clears throat> yes, now to the news. Um, are you having a slow and maybe boring summer coming up? You should try adding googly eyes to inanimate objects and give yourself some new friends. Observe. Happy almost International Donut Day! <laughs> I'm so excited. Also, don't ever, 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 ever forget to make donuts. Don't ever forget.
And now it is time for the Taylor Treasure Box. What we get here. All right. Would you rather be stuck in a vacuum or a dishwasher for one week knowing that you would live? Ugh. Hmm. I guess the dishwasher, because you'd be pretty clean by the end of the week. <laughs> a vacuum would just be sitting in disgusting burr and crumbs. Yeah, I guess it's dirtier. Yeah, I'd probably choose that too. Uh, I have to tell a random fact about myself. I am a Dunkin' Donuts fan. That's not a random fact. <laughs> Objection. <laughs> uh, well, my random fact 2020 edition. Even though we didn't already know it because of this whole episode, but whatever. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to give this video a like and a comment. Make sure to subscribe. And after you subscribe, make sure to press the bell so you get all of our videos in your notifications box. You can also follow us on Instagram at Taylor Treasures Official for behind the scenes pictures and all sorts of stuff. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. And I have to come clean. I've never had a Krispy Kreme donut. I've never had one. Move. What? Oh boy, <laughs> she's trying to catch him. <laughs> <laughs>